Welcome to Bible Tract Echoes. This program is the radio ministry of Bible Tracts Incorporated. Our mission is to take the Word of God to all the world. Our Bible teacher is the director of Bible Tracts, Pastor Mark Smith. Since 1938, Bible Tracts Incorporated has been publishing clear gospel tracts and supplying them to churches, missionaries, and individuals all over the world, and all at no charge. Information on how you can receive a free sample pack of our tracts will be given at the end of this broadcast. Now for our Bible study, here is our teacher, Pastor Mark Smith. Welcome, my friend. Welcome to the broadcast today. Thank you so much for joining us, whether you are listening to the broadcast in your car radio and your home radio, whether you're listening over the internet, whatever the case may be, the fact that you're listening is a great honor. I don't take that lightly, but I do want to take seriously the time we spend together that it bolster our walk with God, your walk as well as mine. Now, right now, my Bible is sitting open to the book of Hebrews and chapter two. If you can, get your own copy of God's word open to that passage, Hebrews two. I'll I'll start reading at verse 5 for our study here today. I have a gospel tract I want to talk to you about as well, but for right now, let me begin this way. As you and I look at God's Word together today on this broadcast, we are about, oh, six months or so away from celebrating Christmas. One of the most famous themes and great themes that preachers like to deal with at Christmas time is the theme about why or the reasons behind Jesus coming to earth and being born in flesh, the incarnation. Just why did the second member of the Trinity allow himself to take on flesh through the process of a physical birth. And frankly, that's a very powerful question for us to answer. The good news is, is that here in Hebrews 2, verses 5 through 18, we're going to be given answers to that very question. Actually, eight answers in all. We will not get to all eight today. We'll get to three of them. So this would be a good day for you to get a piece of paper and something to write with so you can jot down those three reasons, three of the eight, why was Jesus born? of flesh. Also, I'll be giving an outline. You may want to jot that down as well. But with that pen and paper ready, you can jot down our contact information. And here's why. I have a gospel tract in my hand, but it's one of many that I want to take from my hand and put into your hand. I want to send you a complete sample packet, which contains one each of all of our English gospel tracts. Now, the word gospel means good news. The word good news refers to how to know your sins are forgiven, how to know that God has delivered you from the kingdom of darkness, Satan's kingdom, and placed you into the kingdom of his own dear son, Jesus. How do you know you're on your way to heaven rather than on your way to hell? The gospel is good news to escape the judgment to come by being part of the family of God. A gospel tract is a simply a short written presentation of that good news. A gospel tract is a written presentation telling the reader why they need Christ as Savior, what Christ has done to be their Savior, and then how they can receive him by faith. The one in my hand right now is entitled, Born Again born again. That phrase is used in the Bible. Jesus said to a very religious man, he said, you must be born again. That religious man without that born again experience would never get into heaven. Neither will you, my friend, neither will your wife, husband, children, grandchildren, neither will your next door neighbor get into heaven unless they are born again. But rather than be confused about what that term means, this gospel track answers what it is, how it happened, what's God's way of being born again. It's a powerful but simple gospel track. Get it from us. Be ready when my announcer gives that contact information at the end of the broadcast. Come now with me. Hebrews chapter 2. I begin reading at verse 5. Here's what the Bible says. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. 
But one, he's going to quote the Old Testament now, but one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels, thou crownest him with glory and honor, and did set him over the works of thy hand." Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things, to bring many sons unto glory, to make the captain of our salvation perfect through suffering. Hebrews chapters 1 and 2 emphasize Jesus' superiority over angels. And in the opening four verses of the chapter 2 here, the Spirit of God pauses in that superiority discussion and calls the first readers of the book of Hebrews to make a decision. The decision he wants them to make is decide to hold on to God's word no matter what. Now, starting here in verse 5, the Spirit of God turns back to showing the contrast of Jesus to angels. And what we saw in chapter 1 was an emphasis on the future role of Jesus. Uh, We saw there the emphasis on him being the ruler over all things. Here, and beginning at verse 5 of chapter 2 to the end of the chapter, we're going to see an emphasis on the Lord's present role. Well, if I want to use an alliterated outline, I like to do that. Chapter 1 emphasizes the Lord's future role. Chapter 2 emphasizes the Lord's fellowship role with mankind. The rulership role, chapter 1, over mankind. The fellowship role, chapter 2, with mankind. Chapter 2, beginning at verse 5 to the end of the chapter, has two paragraphs. Each paragraph has a title. Here it is. Verses 5 through 10, the passage I read, here Jesus is shown to be the unique man. He's uniquely fit to be earth's ruler. Then, on the next broadcast, we'll go at verses 11 to 18, where Jesus is the united man. He's able to be man's savior because he united in flesh with us. Come with me now. Let's begin at verse 5. Verse 5 through the first part of verse 8 talks about the status of man. Notice the S word, status, the status of man. In these verses, the Spirit of God pulls out a reference from the Old Testament Psalm, Psalm 8. That Psalm is all about the general role, the general role difference between angels and mankind. Remember now, God created a perfect world, and he gave the care of his perfect world into the hands of a perfect man named Adam. Man's role was to have dominion over the planet and to rule it. But when Adam sinned, he became unfit to rule the planet and brought a curse on himself, on his wife, on the world, and his future descendants. Here, God takes that Psalm 8, and he reapplies it not to all mankind, but now to Jesus, the singular second Adam. As the perfect man, as the second Adam, Jesus could be earth's ruler. No angel was ever given this role. No sinful man was fit for the role, but Jesus is fit. All right. That's the status of man, the ruler over the earthly realm. We go to the second half of verse 8. We move from the status of man to the situation of man as it is right now. In the middle of verse 8, we find these words, but now, referring to the earth's present condition, but now we see not yet all things under him. Right now, the world's in a mess, isn't it? The world is in a big mess. While we know that God truly is the sovereign Lord over all things, God is allowing by his sovereign hand to let sin have a season to run its course and yet giving people time to choose to serve God rather than serve sin. That's the situation of man right now. 
We've had the status of man, verses 5 through the first part of verse 8. We have the situation of man, the second part of verse 8. But now, in verses 9 and 10, we have the suffering of man. The suffering of man. Now, you've got to love the way verse 9 opens. Oh, yeah, yeah, we've already said here that the world's in a mess. Yes, it's presently experiencing the mess that man has brought on himself due to sin. We are not presently seeing the overt rulership of Jesus. But still, look at verse 9. It begins, but we, believers, but we see Jesus. The eyes of God's people, despite the world's seeing, we have our eyes, we have our gaze on Christ. We know stuff about the world and about the Savior Christ that the unsaved do not know. Let me give you five words here, all beginning with the letter C, that will lay out what's given to us here in verses 9 and 10. First word is the word condescending. Verse 9 opens with the condescending Christ. He was made lower than the angels. We're talking about the incarnation there. Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us, the condescending Christ. Secondly, verse 9 talks about the crucified Christ. Christ was made lower so that he might suffer death for every man. That's what verse 9 says. Jesus was able to do this in a body of flesh because of God's grace. Don't miss that phrase there in verse 9. He suffered and was able to do that because of God's grace. In his flesh, Jesus needed suffering grace to face and endure the cross. My friend, you and I need suffering grace, and you and I can ask for suffering grace for our life's trials as well. We can find suffering grace in the same source that Jesus did. Third word beginning with the letter C is creator. In verse 10, it's laid out here, the creator Christ. Verse 10 says this, it became him or it was fitting for Jesus to experience the condescension and the crucifixion. Now, even though he was the creator, even though he was the sustainer of the entire universe, as the glorious and exalted creator, he is certainly worthy of worship, but he's unable to save sinners from that vantage point. He can't save sinners from the throne room of heaven. He had to come to earth. The creator must condescend. Number four, the word captain appears in our text, the captain of our salvation. We have the captain Christ. Our verse says Jesus suffered for sinners so that he could be the captain of our salvation. That word captain could correctly be translated by the words pathfinder or the leader of a line. Oh, we all have played follow the leader when we were children. To be saved, you must get in the Jesus line. Jesus died for our sins. Jesus was buried. Jesus rose again. We don't have to die for our sins. Jesus did it, but you you can't get to heaven. You can't participate in the blessings of salvation unless you follow Christ. You must become a follower of Christ. The last word is complete Christ, the complete Christ. God perfected, he completed Christ by charting his path to glory through the door of suffering. And by his suffering, Jesus can more perfectly, more completely help us in our suffering. Oh, friend, we have a complete Savior. Whatever struggle you're going through, run to Christ. God allowed him to suffer that we might learn how to find God's grace as he did. Let's do that today. Amen. Thank you for joining us today for Bible Tract Echoes. If you would like to receive a free sample packet of our tracks, you can contact us by calling 309-828-6888. Our mailing address is Bible Tracks, P.O. Box 188, Bloomington, Illinois, 61702. Again, our phone number is 309-828-6888. And our mailing address is P.O. Box 188, Bloomington, Illinois, 61702. You can also contact us through our website. Our web address is BibleTracksInc.org. Remember, the word tracks is spelled T-R-A-C-T-S. That address is BibleTracksInc.org. May the Lord richly bless you as you serve Him.